we've changed the order a little bit this morning, and uh, hopefully you will understand that in a moment or two. And so I'm following our Old Testament readings this morning with the Gospel of Mark. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which is different than what's in your pew Bible, but you are welcome to follow along. I'm reading from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. Here are the words of Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed in camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the throng of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Here ends our words from Mark this morning. Thanks be to God. There is one to come, greater than me, who will baptize with fire. I am just a voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the... Lord. Don't stop. Surely I need you to baptize me. right. Baptize me. first experience of Jesus becoming really like us. And that's what it was for, partly, you understand. That Jesus had no need to be baptized 
for the forgiveness of his sins because he didn't have any. He was God. But because he came down in human flesh, like we celebrated three weeks ago, he also chose to walk this earth in human flesh all the way to the cross, showing us that this isn't just some traditional ritual act that we do, but indeed it is a holy connection with God. It is very personal, it is very communal in community, and it is very, very cleansing to the spirit. So today we gather around the water. Now, for us, that's an easy thing to do because we live gathered around the water here. So that gives us something in common. Some of us are naturally drawn to water, aren't we? I'm one of those. Uh, perhaps for what it can do to us spiritually, emotionally, and even physically. It's no secret that water is life-sustaining. Our bodies are about 60 to 70 percent water. Did you know that babies, until about the age of one, are actually 78% water. <laughs> We're birthing little fish. Yeah, they are 78% uh, water. When they reach about the age of one, they join us and they're somewhere about 65% composed of water. But listen to this. The adult brain and heart, are those the most two important organs? Your brain and your heart remain 73% water. Now I'm going to uh, take a station break here to say when the doc tells you you need to drink more water, do you get why they're saying that? You know, the, the eight glasses of water every day or whatever you can choke down. Some of you love water. Some of you go, I, mm -mm, one glass is all I can do. So those of you out there that are kind of shy on the getting your, your water Think about 78% of your brain and your heart are saying, please give me something to drink. God's grand design. We should all be drinking more water. So we know that it's really important to our physical be being. A human can go three weeks without food. That would not be me. I, I can't go three days without food, but you get the point. You could exist three weeks without food. You can last at the most three or four days without water. That's not fruit juice. That's just plain aqua. So we get the physical idea of this water that Jesus portrays and sets example for us this morning. But what about the emotional self? How many of you folks value standing by the water's edge at the bay or walking the dock or in front of your own house and looking out at the water? How many people here have done that? Just stood? Yeah. Now to an alien from another planet driving by and they see us just would think that it was something extraterrestrial instead of something created by God, right? Isn't there something that gets you emotionally about breathing in fresh lake air? Can you, can you sense it? Yeah. How about sensing that breeze that comes over you when you're by this large body of water of ours? I don't know about you, but something happens that brings a fresh, calm, peaceful sense to me, and at times can do the opposite. At times, when I walk down there and stand in that sand, I can feel invigorated or renewed. It renews my energy and my mind 
and I can return to my life refreshed without ever stepping my feet in the water. What a powerful symbol God gave us. So it seems important today, as we read in Mark's Gospel, that Jesus chose to go down to the Jordan and have John baptize him, refresh him, cleanse him in the waters of the Jordan. can be for many reasons, physically, spiritually, and now what about that spiritual sense? The word baptism in the Greek is called baptizo, and it means to immerse or plunge or dip. But for the Greeks, it also had a metaphorical meaning. And the metaphorical meaning was to identify. Oh, there's another way to look at that in conjunction with to immerse or dip. In secular liturgy, liturg sorry, liturg literature in the Greek time, Euripides and Homer, you remember him, he's the guy that wrote the Odyssey, took note of this identification process in baptizo, and I think both of those ideas come together for us this morning. Like many, I was baptized as an infant. How many people baptized as an infant around here? Yeah, look at the hand. We are not alone. We are like 80% of us, absolutely. Baptized as an infant. Well, that's what we were supposed to do. I have no recollection of the event. I don't know, remember anything about the water. I was told that I slept through it all. Even the par party that happened in honor of the occasion. I was out cold. My godparents were the ones who were put on the spot. How many godparents do we have here that are yeah, godparents? Yeah, it was not me, I was sleeping. But the godparents spoke for me in the community of faith. They were asked the questions that were put on their heart at the baptism event. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the way of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, answer for the child, I do. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, answer for the child, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, answer, I do. Do you, as the godparents, agree to support and nurture this child, and bring them up in the faith and make them a child supported by Jesus Christ? If so, answer, we will. Bingo! There it is. I wonder how many people have literally supported that connection throughout the lives of your godchildren, even though they may have moved away and things happen and life happens, um, the thing that the godparents are charged with doing is if all else fails with human connection, pray for that kid. See that? You got somebody praying for you there, Jack, I'm telling you. you know, he's, the exams are coming. We're I got you covered. So does, yeah, all right. In baptism, we submerge ourselves into the depths of God's grace and love, and we rise from the water just like you saw Jesus do as new people, able to identify with Jesus, our role model, and to follow him wherever he leads. For Presbyterians, we see the baptism not only as a personal event for the family and the godparents, but we see that as an experience for the community of faith. We take our job as a church community seriously. And so at the end of our process, we say, after all of that, and the child 
is dipped and it's messy. God tells us that it wasn't a sprinkle. God still condones, and we as Presbyterians still condone, that if so desired, I am empowered to go down to the water and baptize you in, the, in Lake Huron. Immersion is still an okay thing. But the least we are to do is to make the presence of the cleansing water of God so that you come out changed cleansed, renewed, you know, wring out your clothing. Let's go back a minute. Hmm. When you were little, I don't know how little, I'm talking about me too, okay? And it was hot out, <laughs> and you wanted to swim. You walk out, this is me, I'm speaking for myself. And I would put my toes just at the edge. And every time the wave would come up, and it was pretty cold, Lake Huron cold, Lake Superior. Anybody been in Lake Superior in the summer? Holy smokes, people. That's cold, that's what are that, okay? Lake Huron's like a hot tub compared to that, okay? But every time that wave would come up, I would back up, right? And then I'd creep out. And then I'd back up. Well, if it was in the summer and it was down at the, down at the uh, beach by the dock, I would turn around and there would always be kids that would walk up, put their towel down on the beach next to mom and dad. Oh, sorry, Chris, I'm coming. All right. And I would, and they would, with authority, just keep walking. And they'd walk right up till their waist and dive in. And I'm still standing back there. And I would watch them, and I would think, boy, they're pretty brave. All right, then there was the other kid. Mom and Dad bring down the beach, they set their cooler down there, they put out their blankets, the kid's like taking his t-shirt off, I'm always thinking it's a guy, because I don't know what, you know, what can I say. And the kid would start from back here, and he would go. I would go, how rude! And guess what? I'm still standing back here. And so I go, well, shoot, I'm looking bad. So I go out, ankles, got the ankles, and then I would slowly work my way out to up to the waist, and every time, now the waves are bigger out there, right? And every time I would see that coming, what do you do? <laughs> don't you? It's like, oh, don't get it up to my rib cage. Whoa! You know? It would take me a half an hour to get wet until some smart aleck on this side. Not you, Margie. I'm pointing at Margie. <laughs> Yeah, she would do it. Yeah, she would do it to me now. Yeah, some smart aleck, like Margie over there. And this kid would come around and see. He was watching, playing with his, his peeps, right? He's watching the little peanut on the shore. And he comes up in the water when I'm up to my waist, and he goes, woo, 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 woo. <laughs> so what do I do then? <laughs> then I dive in. Now, I just want to make sure that you're all with me on this story. Here's the deal. Then once I went in, I would go all the way under. I wasn't afraid of it. I just didn't like to be cold so good. And I would go under and I would come up. And the first thing, what happens when you plunge like that? You let the water run down and you wipe your eyes and you go, Phew. But you know what? I would feel refreshed, I would feel clean, I would feel peaceful and happy, and then I could have fun. 
God put water in all forms for us on this earth so that we wouldn't take it for granted, but we would use it in ways that would make us think about him. And isn't that my thought for today? How many of us in terms of faith are like that? We got some people who go, trusting in Jesus, no problem, and they're off. Totally trusting that they're not going to trip on a rock, trip on the sand, they're just going to go plunge in, get it over with, because they have unabandoned faith. Then there's those who are, I know my mission is to grow my faith, to be close to Jesus, and I know I'm charged with accomplishing that. And very systematically, they walk out into the water, not stopping, but diving in then, and receiving all of those gifts of grace and love. And then there are the chicken hearts, who know that water is a good thing, who know that there is a good experience at the end of this process, but are still a little hesitant to plunge. So they pray and talk to themselves inch by inch by inch. At some times, don't we? Oh, God, I don't think I can do everything you're asking. Okay, I'll try again. Okay, I know that this is only a grace-filled moment. It's, I'm going to have joy when it's i, I got to walk there. Not yet, God. See? Not yet, God. I'm not getting out, but not yet, God. And then finally, maybe someone in your life has splashed you into taking the dive. Maybe that's a family member, maybe that's someone you know, maybe that's a good friend, but somehow you needed some encouragement to dive. Mm -hmm. And then once they did it, you went, okay, okay, okay. Whoosh. Ah, this is where I'm supposed to be, God. This is where I'm supposed to be. I hope that you think of that and that you never take this moment of your baptism with water wherever you see it to remind yourself of the faith and the power, the power that God has to wash you absolutely clean and let you start over. See, the only place that you get to start your life over is through the grace of Jesus. There it is. That's all I'm saying. And you all know that. We read it. You just said it in the, crew, the creed, okay? And so today I say to you, you were baptized in the name of the Father and of his Son and of his Holy Spirit. May you walk in the water of Jesus for the rest of your life. Amen.